Our scripture lesson for us this morning comes from the, the book of Genesis, uh, chapters 2 and 3, uh, beginning in chapter 2 at verse 15. Listen for God's Word for you this morning. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. But in that day, if, uh, for in, in the day uh, that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was the most crafty of all the other wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say that you shall not eat from the, any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the tree of any, or fruit of the tree in the garden, uh, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You shall not touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloth for themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We all have uh, family stories that we tell. They uh, give us a sense of our identity and who we are. The, we all know, too, that we make uh, a lot of different choices in the stories that we choose to tell. And uh, because, you know, if you tell it a certain way or if you tell certain stories and leave out others, it can leave a different uh, image. For instance, I can tell you about my father, business owner, Faithful father and husband, committed community leader. I can tell you about my mother, who's a university professor, a national lecturer, an advocate for prison education, uh, goes into the prisons to teach classes often. I can tell you stories about them and lead to one picture. Or I can tell you, as I did a few weeks ago, the story of my dad who saw himself as the king of Hollies. And, uh, or I can tell you the story of whenever uh, he rode up in his uh, 56 Chevy with two four-barrel uh, carburetors on it and uh, you know this loud, raucous car and a guy that he had had a feud with pulled up in a Volkswagen bug beside him and how at the intersection of 29th and Western, he and his friends parked his car and went over and rolled the Volkswagen over on top of itself in the, the middle of the intersection. It, it gives you a little different picture of who my dad is. Um, I, I can tell you the story of whenever, I, I don't know why I would have done it, but uh, I, we had this grouchy neighbor who absolutely hated me and my brother, but adored our little sister. And, uh, and, but anyway, he was, was in his backyard, and, uh, and he hollered at my dad, and he said, uh, your son's been throwing nails into my backyard. And... Uh, and, and my dad said, well, no, he hadn't, you know, to, just to def be defensive. And the guy said, well, yeah, here they are. And he showed him three nails, and he said, that one's not mine. Those two are mine, and I threw them in your backyard. I, you know, I mean, he, he didn't like it, I guess, someone, you know, going after a son, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe he just thought that he was a grouch, and, you know, he was going to give it back. We can all tell different stories about our family, and they, they tell us they create a different picture of, of who we are. And um, I had a, well, I don't even, can't even tell you how long ago the first email was. You know, in, in Facebook, 
how you have your messages that come in, and, and every once in a while, one comes in, and it's not someone who's a friend of yours, and it goes into this other folder. And I never look into the other folder. I glanced through, and I saw that I'd gotten this, this message, and I just deleted it and didn't think anything more of it. I got another message from this same person uh, about, I don't know, two months ago, and uh, she, she said that, that she had bought a storage compartment, storage building, the contents of the storage building uh, in Wichita, Kansas, and wanted to know if I knew Mary Morton. I had no idea who Mary Morton was. She said, in there, there are some pictures of Angie and Slim and Tinker, or Tom. Now, Tom was my dad, Angie is my grandmother, and Slim, they called him, uh, was my grandfather. And I said, well, I, clearly you got, those are my family, you know, and, uh, and she had asked me if I'd done a funeral um, I thought she was asking for this lady, Mary Morton, and I looked in my calendars. I, I, young people laugh at me because I actually have a calendar that I write things down in, it's, uh, and I have these going back for years. And so I pulled out the calendar from the year that Mary Morton had died, and she died on a Friday, so I looked on Monday, and I didn't have anything down as having done a service then, and... and uh, and then she said, no, no, you didn't do her service. There was a service for a Bob Canada that you did, who was my uncle. And, uh, and, I, and so she took a picture of a few of the photos that were there. And she said, there, there are all these family photos. And I just wanted to see, I kept looking at them. I wanted to see if there was a way to reunite them with who they belonged and with. And, uh, and I did a Facebook search, and I came up with your name. And so... She made the contact, and uh, a week or two later, uh, received a package. And sh what she sent me a picture of was maybe 10 photos. What she sent in the mail was maybe 100 photos. And these were my grandmother, Angie, uh, her photos. And they were family photos, some from her in childhood, some of her family, some of our family. Her birthday is July 17th. My dad's was July 19th and mine was July 21st. And so a lot of times we would have one family gathering and celebrate all three birthdays. And there were a couple of photos that were of the three of us sitting together at the table. And I know it had to be our birthday. It's the only reason you'd have the three of us just uh, alone sitting together. And so she sent, sent these photos. And um, and they're, they're family photos that go back a ways. I uh, was surprised to see how many ties there were in the, the photos. I guess they all got dressed up because I know they were dirt poor. They were not uh, well to do. But in this photo, uh, it says on the back here, Dad's uh, brother, Spiller's side. So my, my aunt, my grandmother, uh, Angie, was the Spillers before she got married. And so this is Dad's brother. So my great-grandfather, great-great-uncle, I guess, uh, was in, in this picture on the Spiller side. And uh, as you look through the, the photos, sometimes you, you see images that uh, look familiar. Um, this one, I thought they just looked happy. And uh, it, doesn't have, it doesn't really have names down. It has K and a couple of names that I, I don't recognize, no last names. And it has their, their ages in it. Um, but I just I thought it was kind of a, kind of a happy photo. Because a, a nice happy photo from this era, very few of them smiled. Do you remember? They, they didn't smile in the photos. This was my, uh, my grandfather. They called Slim. I called Pete, but his name was Evan. I don't know why, you know, he had all these names. But, uh, but that we always learned, we just called him Grandpa Pete. And, uh, uh, but Slim is what everybody called him, but his actual name was Evan. But he's the one right in the middle, and that's his father, uh, Tom Canada. And uh, so that would be my great-grandfather. I, I never saw him. I never, never knew who he was, never met him. Um, this is, again, the same. 
uh, Tom Canada and my, my grandfather Slim as a young boy. Uh, I guess I'm surprised to see him in a three-piece suit because I never heard of any, any of them dressed up in that way. This was my grandmother, Angie. She, uh, when I, you know, I remember her at home, but first memories away from uh, the house and family gatherings, she worked at TG&Y. She sold uh, retail. She worked at J.C. Penney's. She worked at Dillard's. She uh, uh, just wherever she could could get a, a job working in retail. My uh, grandfather had had a stroke as a young man and was on disability. Uh, the only way he earned money was that he would uh, buy old messed up guns and he would repair them and then resell them on the market. And whatever money he could make is how he uh, got by. My dad at 13 had to take a job to help support the family. That's where he started working at the uh, Beacon Publishing Company. And he was sleeping the floors at the print shop and uh, even told then he didn't do it right. But uh, eventually he stuck around long enough, he became the owner. And, uh, uh, but my grandmother, I don't, until she was in her 70s, I don't remember seeing her smile. Never saw her smile. On the back of this picture, it says, poor thing, she wrote about herself. Um, here she is. She's the, the second from the left. That's her mother in the middle. That's Grandma Spillers. I didn't know her as Grandma Spillers. She was Grandma Donut to us. You remember me telling that story? That uh, the, my aunt, you know, we all called her Grandma Donut. And my aunt, who had just married into the family, asked, well, why do you call her Grandma Donut? And my dad, just always the prankster, he said, well, because back in the Civil War, she got shot through with a cannon, and uh, she has a hole in the middle. And, uh, you know, of course, Aunt Sharon would believe anything, so she'd kind of look at her to, in the light, you know, see if you can see the light to kind of shine through. But uh, the truth is, she lived next door to a guy who was a hostess delivery uh, man. And he would get free broken donuts, powdered sugar donuts. And so she, whenever she came, she would bring a bag of broken powdered sugar donuts. And as kids, we delighted. I mean, that was just like heaven uh, to have poured out. And so she was, was Grandma Donut. This is, my, again, my grandmother, uh, Angie, with her three kids. Now, to let you know, the, her sternness, that's my dad right in the middle. So he's the, the happy, smiling, mischievous one, and she was the stern one. I still can't figure out why she sent these pictures off to Mary Morton, but these are all the family photos, some we've never seen before. This is her, my granddad, uh, Pete, my dad's the one in the middle, and then his brother and sister. And then right after coming back from uh, boot camp and then being sent off to Anchorage, Alaska, is a picture of my dad uh, before he went out. And then after that time and uh, the kids grown up, I don't remember my grandpa so tall. Uh, he looks as tall as my dad. My dad is 6'5". And I knew my granddad was over six foot, but I didn't ever think of him as as tall as my dad. And then this is my granddad lying back in the recliner. They said it was on a Sunday afternoon, and that happens to be me on his lap. Photo I'd never seen in my whole life until uh, this lady stuck him in the, the mail to me. Uh, we have our, our family stories, our Stories that they give us a sense of our identity and a sense of who we are in our lives. And um, what we have in the Old Testament, particularly in these first chapters of Genesis, I think are the equivalent to our human family stories. They are the family stories of humanity that tell us who we are that give us a sense of our identity, of what it's like to grow up where we grow up, to be the people we are, to have lived in our families, to understand that context of our identity. 
Um, in the story we have particularly in the book of Genesis today is the story of humanity's fall. We remember the story of creation. God created the world. God creates humanity. God pronounces it good. God places them in the garden. Everything is set for them. Original blessing, someone called it. Uh, the way we were created and intended to be. And yet, God created us with free will. And our free will led us away from all of the goodness that God had intended for us. We acted in what we felt was our own self-interest, not because it was really bad fruit to eat from the tree, just maybe curiosity drove us so to have that which we weren't supposed to. It says something to us about our human nature, that uh, we are created good, and yet we are fallen and sinful. And we will find ways to get our life off of track. It's a story about who we are, about every one of us. The story is just as true as it is of you, as it is of me, as it is of every person who's here today. It's our nature. It's a part of our human family story. God creates us and leads us to this place, um, a place where we fall into temptation. And just as those old family stories give us our identity, so these stories tell us our own. They tell us who we are. Those stories were not systematic theology. It didn't start with a doctrine of the goodness of creation and a doctrine of temptation and sin and then a doctrine of redemption. It tells us the story of creation and sin and fall and redemption. It, 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 in many ways, it, it's much more vivid than our abstract understanding could come. But yet, sometimes we, we get to the place where we want to be able to understand it and analyze it, and we work our way out into theology. But the story, if you, at least if you grew up in a family like mine, the story is so much better because the story illustrates it with laughter and humor and, uh, you know, the snake, the most crafty of all the animals. You know, can't you imagine the, uh, the old storytellers telling that story of creation? Uh, you got to have a villain in there, right? You know, woven in there and uh, tempting us away, maybe like the stories that family told us whenever we would go to bed at night. I remember, we, it was always our practice as the kids were growing up, that uh, Angie would go with one of the kids and read him a story at bedtime, and I would go with the other and read him a story at bedtime. Our kids slept in their beds. They did not sleep in ours. If they came in and slept in ours, we immediately got them and took them to their bed to go back to sleep. Um, but... We, we would take him, and we would lay him down, and we'd go through the story. And I remember so clearly Thomas saying one night, you know, asking, what story would you like? And he said, none of those. Tell me one of the family stories. He wanted to hear about who he is. He wanted to know the family story that would define who he is. When we gather for worship, part of what we do is to tell our family story to tell who we are as human beings, the goodness of our creation, our brokenness and sin, and then this relational life that we live with God, God redeeming us and restoring us, us being on the good path for a while, falling away, and then for God to come after us again. When we hear the story of the prodigal son, we hear and we see ourselves in the story. We know as we've fallen away and we have wandered away from God's goodness. We know what it's like to have been there. And we know what it's like when we have decided to turn and come home to find the embrace of God and the welcome. We know what it's like to have been the one who was the good all along while the other was out messing things up. And to stand outside the door with our arms folded and saying, I am not going in for a party for him. We've done it, haven't we? We felt it. 
Some of you, I know you feel it. Maybe you're not quite so bold to stand outside, but you felt it in your heart whether you did it or not. We know what that story is because it's ours. It tells us about our life and who we are. It tells us about how we get through in life. You know, it, it'd be easy to blame the snake in the story, wouldn't it? Oh, the snake finds this place and just kind of works its way in and goes after the, the, the woman when she's alone and tempts her away. It might be easy to blame the woman, huh? Because she's the one who first gets tempted in. Oh, the man, he's just a poor innocent victim, right? You know? It's easy to want to push blame off somewhere else. The worst thing you could do in my house as a kid is to say the devil made me do it. That was the worst thing you could ever do is to not take responsibility for what you did. The devil made you do that? No, I don't think so. You made your own choices. You may have been tempted. The devil may have played a role in tempting, but you made your own choices. Not so easy to pass off. We learn those lessons. We learn the full story because it's our own and we've experienced it. Let me tell you another interesting story. Um, you've probably seen how it's happened, but they had built a, a, a submarine that would go to depths in the water that were deeper than they'd ever imagined. Uh, far beyond what the light could ever penetrate. So they'd built this small little submarine, compact, to go down. They put a couple of guys in it, and they sent it down. They'd put these headlights out on the, the top of the submarine, and they dropped it down to some of the deepest parts of, of the ocean. And when it got down there, they had those lights on, and all they could see was just murkiness. I mean, it was just murky. Then they did... Maybe the most amazing thing, they turn the lights out. Can you imagine going to the depth of darkness in the sea? What would be complete darkness and they turn the lights out, expecting to only see darkness. You know what happened? It came alive. The life that was there began to glow and show in, a, in, a, uh, in an essence that was far more beautiful than they could ever have imagined. Certainly far more beautiful than they could see with their pitiful spotlights that were shining out into it. What they found is in the darkness was something beautiful and not so crazy to be afraid of. It's amazing. Even in our darkness, we're not alone. Even when we are in the darkest places, the story tells us of humanity's sin, of how it comes into the world, and how we missed out on this beautiful Garden of Eden because we were looking out for our own. And, and yet, even in that brokenness, God's with them. There's no place we go. Even darkness to God is like light. Our wisdom is but foolishness to God. There's no place in life, there's nothing a part of us that is so dark that it's irredeemable of God's grace. It's amazing. I heard someone once say it like this. It was only when things got really bad when I knew that I couldn't go on under my own strength. And it's then that I discovered God's lo love had been undergirding me, had been lifting me up. It had been there all along, and I only realized it when I was able to let go. Sometimes we fight the darkness so hard that we realize only when we fought it that God's the one who's really been fighting. God's the one who's been upholding us all along. And when we allow ourselves to rest in God's grace, we see there's really very little to fear. Even the darkness is as light to him. 
These are our family stories. They're the stories that tell us about who we are. They're stories we could tell about Chickasha that identify and that create the image of who this community is. They're stories about this church, Epworth. The thing we should always remember about Epworth is, remember how it happened? The name Epworth became important. Epworth was the town that John Wesley, founder of Methodism, grew up in. His father was the parish priest there. And there was a fire in the parsonage when John, they called him Jack, little Jack was young. All the family got out of the house And Jack alone was upstairs. They tried to get to him. The fire was blocking the stairway. They couldn't find a way to get to him. Youngest of the children. He pushed a chest or something to crawl up on underneath the window, climbed up to the window, and the people outside made a physical ladder leaning against the house so that they could take him and pull him out to safety. Epworth means our place of home but it also means our place of salvation. It's here where we come to know God's saving in our lives. It is our home to which we are grounded, and it is our salvation. Later on, John Wesley's mother said that he was like a brand plucked from the fire. And he himself talked about it as done for divine purpose and intent. That's the other part. It's not only our home, And it's not only the place in which we experience God's salvation, but it's also here that we find our purpose and our mission and our intent for life. God grounds us with the story, with this place. And when we come here, all parts of that are here for us. It's our home to which we belong. It's the place where God's grace is outpoured. And it's where we find our purpose in our mission in life. Amen.